Hello everyone and welcome to our first webinar for today. I am Mohammed Al Zajali, petroleum engineering student at University of Oklahoma, and I will be your moderator for this amazing webinar. Our webinar today is about diagnostic testing using wavelet analysis, which will be presented uh, by Dr. Ali Rizai. Dr. Rizai is a research associate at the University of Houston, USA. Dr. Rizai is a postdoc at University of Houston. His main area of expertise is computational geomechanics with applications to hydro hydraulic fracture modeling. Coupled for elastic problems and analysis of DFIT, he has eight years of experience in the area of model development for hydraulic fracturing uh, problems. He, his developments include programming library composed of several, several hydraulic fracturing models, including uh, elastic fully coupled for elastic, a fast multiple multiple fully of coupled for elastic hydraulic fracture model, and the software for fracture diagnostic using a signal uh, processing techniques. In his career, Dr. Rizai has authored and co-authored more than 25 technical papers and a book chapter and collaborated on several NSF, DOE, and industry-founded projects. It's our pleasure to have you today, Dr. Ali, and the mic is definitely yours. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, and hello, everybody. I hope um, you're safe and healthy wherever you are uh, during this, this pandemic. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and share um, some discussion about signal processing approach for hydraulic fracture diagnostics and um, interval connectivity. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge um, the companies who are, uh, who are sponsoring this project and also uh, the team here at UH Petroleum Engineering Department who are um, collaborating um, on, on this project. Um, we have five companies, Marathon Oil, Southwestern, Shell, and Halliburton and Hess um, in UH Diagnostic Testing Consortium who are sponsoring this project. Um, our team is Professor Mohamed Solomon, the head of the team, um, who I believe had a talk um, two weeks ago um, uh, on waterless fracturing. Uh, my former colleague, Dr. Uh, Fat Siddiqui, who collaborated uh, with us uh, on this project, Dr. Ebru Onel, um, who um, worked on her PhD on this subject, and Ibrahim El Talib and Mohamed Awad, who are doing PhD um, in this group. Let me talk about the outline of the uh, presentation for today. Um, I will start by a brief introduction about uh, what is signal processing and what is signal. Um, then I will um, try to answer why signal processing is needed. I think that's an important question that anybody needs to ask or uh, um, before I start uh, developing things in signal processing. Um, after that, I will talk about wavelet transform, which is the specific type of the signal processing that we use um, in this research. And um, I will talk about uh, different, three different applications of that analysis um, using wavelet transform in different three, in three areas. Um, during hydraulic fracturing process, um, I assume that um, you are familiar with hydraulic fracturing process. I will explain a little bit uh, what is being analyzed there. Um, the second topic for today is diagnos diagnostics fracture injection test, or what people know it as DFIT. Um, and the third topic is interval connectivity, which is a, which basically uh, it concerns with how injector and pro uh, producers are connected to one another. Um, after that, I will summarize and talk about the conclusions of this study and uh, will give you some references for further reading. Um, so let's uh, start by signal processing. First, um, what is a signal? A signal is a function that carries um, some information about the phenomenon in, in time um, or a space domains. So it can be there um, through a time or within a space. Um, signal processing, by definition, is an electrical engineering subfield 
but it is used in all other disciplines in petroleum engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering. Uh, and we, in, in our daily life, in or our, our, our daily um, work, we do some sort of signal processing. Um, focus uh, in this, te this technique, signal processing, is focuses on analyzing, modifying, and synthesizing signals and try to extract information from signals. The examples of signals can be sound, um, image that we see in XY domain, and scientific measurements like uh, the pressure that you may read from a gauge, uh, temperature or rate, all of these are signals because, they, as I said, they carry information for us. Um, in one categorization, signal can be um, uh, categorized to two types, continuous, like sound, when, when you hear it continuously, um, and it is needed to be that way, and discontinuous, where we pick uh, points or samples from a continuous signal, like the pressure and rate that we record from the field, those are discontinuous signals, because uh, we pick, we have some samples reading from, let's say, every other second or every second, and so on. Um, so this is the main thing about signal processing. Um, so let's talk about different methods before I go through them. Um, let's talk about the other methods that we use. Uh, so here's a summary of all the techniques that uh, we use for the three different parts of this talk that I talked that I uh, mentioned earlier. For hydraulic fracturing problem, we have the injection when, when we inject uh, fracking fluid. Um, the techniques for analyzing that data is Nolte-Smith plot, uh, a very well-known and popular technique. Uh, moving reference point, which um, is a modification to Nolte-Smith plot, um, and it has some advantages over Nolte-Smith. I will explain that uh, in the talk. And then wavelet. These three are the, our main tools for analyzing injection during uh, injection pres pressure and rate during hydraulic fracturing. Uh, for shotting or defeat, we have G function, S square root time, log log, wavelet, and um, the method by Siddiqui et al. So um, somebody raised hand. I, I don't know how how we're going to. Um, should I, should I wait till the end of the presentation or you want me to answer the questions as they come? Uh, we will have a question, uh, Q&A part at the end of the presentation, so you are good to continue. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, you for interwell connectivity, we have a CRM, a streamlined simulation, uh, data science, uh, wavelet, cross-correlation, and other signal processing techniques. So, uh, this is a summary of all the techniques that I will talk about some of them in this presentation. Um, so let's now try to answer this question, uh, why signal processing is needed and important. The current models that we, we have for analyzing uh, fracturing or pressure, uh, pressure data, rate data, or during EOR, um, they all have some assumptions and simplifications, and each of them looks at the problem from a different angle. So in that sense, they, um, it, it seems like the, uh, the elephant in the dark room, if you ha heard about it. So looking, uh, to looking at this problem from different angles um, uh, results in igno ignoring other aspects of the problem and you may just come up with like a, a conclusion about what you see from the problem. And because of that, the models are not suitable for problems in unconventional reservoirs uh, and when the, pro when the uh, problems that you're dealing with, uh, with the reservoirs become um, more complicated in deep field hydraulic fracture propagation and, and so on. Um, signal processing, um, is a, is a great method because it has minimum assumptions. We, we basically treat rate pressure or temperature as signals and we try to extract information. It doesn't have assumption about the data itself. Um, there is no cleaning. Um, and another advantage is that it can be used in real-time analysis. Sometimes when we're doing the, let's say, a field job, um, 
One need, needs to wait till the end of the job um, until they can analyze it. Using this signal processing, we can do it in real time. Uh, that way we can save money and um, probably stop a failure. So um, wavelets, as I said, are the specific type of the signal processing that we use in this research. And uh, the pulse-like functions uh, been developed by Har in 1910. So you see different types of wavelets here. Um, you have Har wavelet, Dobachi 4, 2, and 20. They have some properties. Average value of them are zero. They have non-zero norms, um, limited duration, and are defined by two functions. So a wavelet function, which is called mother wavelet, and a scaling function, um, um, which you see on, on these, um, and are classified to discontinuous and continuous um, uh, uh, types. In this research, what we have been using is discontinuous uh, wavelets. The advantage of using wavelet is, um, other, unlike other uh, signal processing techniques like Fourier transform, uh, where you're only able to get the frequency of an event and the time information is lost, here you can um, locate that event in time as well. So basically you can shift between or transfer between time and frequency domains. So our methodology or workflow is as follows. So as I said, we use discrete wavelet transform in a multi-resolution analysis. Um, the way it works, we get the signal. If you have the signal, um, it, this can be pressure, rate, or temperature. We pass it through different levels of high-pass filter and low-pass filter. So after passing through these filters, which based on using these equations, um, you extract some noise from the data, and then you end up with a smoother data. And then again, you, you treat this one as another signal, you go to next step and do the same analysis, take out some um, uh, noise from the data, and you continue this until uh, you reach to the maximum number of the composition levels which is a function of number of points that um, we have. And this technique has been used in petroleum industry for a long time um, to uh, smooth the data. When you get a noisy data, um, people um, try to extract the noise from it and then analyze the, the smoothed data. Here in this research, we, uh, we analyze the noise that is in the data. So our approach is different uh, than the conventional approach in petroleum industry or in other, other uh, fields in that sense. Um, you, what you see here is an example of a pressure curve um, in, in black. And you see um, the composition level four, uh, the noise level four removed from the data and plotted on top of it. And as you can see, um, the original pressure doesn't show that much um, variation, but here you're able to see some sort of changes in, in the noise that is um, basically embedded for in the data. Um, another concept is pseudo frequency. As I said, um, wavelets have uh, limited duration and because of that, uh, frequency cannot be defined on them, really. Um, so what they do is uh, they, uh, uh, there is a definition for pseudo frequency where you put a signal, let's say a signal, a sign signal with a known frequency on top of your wavelet. Um, and this center one is, is called um, uh, center frequency of that uh, specific signal. And using this equation, you can get your um, pseudo frequency. So then if, if you see some, some event in, in that, in some, um, like somewhere in your data, you can basically get the pseudo frequency of that.
So the way that we use the, the we analyze signal, uh, basically the, the type of the signals that we analyze, as I told you, are um, pressure and rate during hydraulic fracturing, because both of them are recorded, um, and pressure for defeat. Uh, and I will explain what is defeat uh, if you don't know it. Um, and also for um, EOR or water flooding, um, we get pressure and rate, both of them, and we analyze them. So. Um, let's look at this chart here. This chart showing um, a hydraulic fracturing job. Um, what you see in red is a uh, rate. So you start injecting and uh, the black one is a pressure recording from the well bore. And as you see, we try to keep uh, the rate constant and um, the pressure and uh, we record pressure as a response. And then at some point you enter propant um, um, to, to your rate. Um, of fracking fluid. Um, what you can extract from this data is one interesting thing is if you look at this pressure, you see at the, at the point that you're entering propant, there is an event. And also you're able to see that in, in, the, in the rate data as well. And toward the end of this job, um, this part of the job is something that we don't want because um, that's an indication of a screen out. The pressure goes up in an uncontrolled manner, um, you start seeing another uh, event here toward the end of the job. So this is the way uh, we can extract some data from it, but I will explain um, uh, in more detail um, what other information can be extracted. Um, another interesting um, concept that we have been using in this uh, in the, our analysis is um, signal energy or energy density plot or you can sometimes call it energy distribution plots. Um, let's say we have a, a function in time and as I said we sample it with some um, uh, intervals let's say one every one second so if we integrate this and calculate the area below this curve, uh, we can come up with no, one number that can be, um, we can name it energy of the signal or the ma magnitude of the signal. Um, and uh, the, the equation for using that, actually the equation that we use for calculating that number is, um, is uh, um, shown here. Then, um, if we go to that multi-resolution analysis and extract the noise from the data, and we apply the same, uh, same equation here and normalize it by what we calculated for the original signal, um, we can come up with a plot that I will show, but uh, we can say what percentage of a signal is a noise in, in a specific level. So let me give you an example for that. Let's say we have this pressure data from the previous plot that I showed you. Um, and this is the smoothed after we do the analysis and you see noise level one, higher frequency, lower frequency and lowest frequency. And if we calculate, if we calculate this number, basically the, what the area below the, the, the graph for any of these, and um, uh, normalize it, but what we have here, we can come up with a plot like this, which is called energy density plot. So for level one, you have a number, level two a number, and then this is, uh, as you can see, it can, it can have, can have uh, different trends. Um, this app, this energy density plots have been used in other industries uh, for identify pitting versus uh, general corrosion, and we're using it in, in hydraulic fracturing and um, defeat for, um, for some uh, reasons. So another, um, another concept that you need to know is energy distribution plot. It's different than energy density plot. Energy density plot is just a number. Energy density plot is the distribution of a specific decomposition level noise um, in time. Um, here, um, what, we can, uh, what we can say is that this great wavelet transform preserves the energy of the signal, basically. Um, and um, this is the equation that I told you about uh, in the previous signal, so in previous slide. 
Um, if we choose one of those levels now, let's say we choose level six or five or four, any of those, and we plot it in time, um, and notice that the y-axis here is in log scale, then we can do some analysis with that. Um, I will talk much more about what you see here in this plot, but I just wanted to wanted you to distinguish between energy distribution plot and uh, energy density plot. So now let's go um, to the first part of uh, the application of wavelet transform and analysis for um, bottom hole pressure and rate pressure during injection. So you saw this plot in the previous slides. Um, here we have a hydraulic fracturing job. As I said, we record pressure and rate and propane concentration and other, other things. But what we have mainly here is pressure and rate. Um, what we do in our analysis, we take the rate signal as the source and pressure signal as a target because we're injecting and we get a response, uh, which is pressure from the reservoir. Um, if there is no change um, or let's say noise um, in, uh, in the source, which is rate, there shouldn't be any change or noise um, in target, which is pressure. Um, and if we saw some changes in the energy of the signal or the noise um, in one of these, let's say in pressure, and we don't see it in rate, then that noise should have come from somewhere. And we think that is coming from um, and fracture propagation, interaction between a hydraulic fracture and natural fracture, uh, height growth, and so on. Let's see how, how um, this analysis will look like with, on, on a real data. Uh, but before that, let me talk about um, some popular techniques that are, that are used um, for analyzing hydraulic fracturing data. Nolte-Smith technique is probably the, worst, the, the most well-known technique for um, analyzing fracturing data is an accurate interpretation of fracturing events on pressure. Um, it's uh, on a log-log scale. Uh, therefore, it compresses data and results in a slowness. Uh, one need to wait at least half a cycle before making decision, and I will tell you what this means. Um, let me basically plot it. So in log log scale, you need to um, plot your p-net versus log of t. And before making decision, you have to wait half, um, at least um, uh, half a cycle. And you need to have closure pressure in advance uh, if you want to work with this technique, because here you have p-net. Um, based on the slope of the line that you see, um, in this technique, you can come up with different interpretation of what's going on with the fracturing. For example, if um, you have a slope like this, less than one is the propagation with peaking geometry. Uh, if, a slope, if the slope is zero, um, you have height growth in addition to length growth um, or increase in fluid loss or both. If the slope increases, it's not a good indication. Um, um, usually, uh, we don't want that, that uh, slope to get definitely more than two because that's an indication of um, uh, a screen out. If the slope is negative, that means rapid height growth or potentially KGD or radial fracture geometry. So each part of this plot means uh, something in, in Nolte spin technique. Um, in our group, my uh, former colleagues, um, Piraish et al., um, developed um, a technique called moving reference point, which is a modification to Nolte-Smith technique and is based on some proven concept that fracture propagates in a step. So basically in Nolte-Smith, you think that the uh, propagation happens uh, continuously here is a stepwise. So fracture gets uh, energized then uh, a step of propagation happens. And um, again, this, uh, this process continues. Um, the advantage of multi, this moving reference point or MRP, which I will call it MRP, and I want you uh, to please remember this because I will refer to this uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, slides. Uh, the advantage is that um, it, it faster detects fracturing events. 
um, and it doesn't require the closure pressure in advance. So in this technique, you need to calculate an E and you plot the E versus time. And uh, the value of E, uh, each value of E means something here. If E is approximately close to 0.25, that means the normal fracture extension. What you see in this green uh, area here, if your pressure, if your E um, uh, is, is within this uh, Green area means that uh, normal fracture extension. If E is close to one in this red, red zone means uh, that's no good, uh, it's a screen out. If E is less than one or negative, that means rapid height growth. And E, if E is zero, means uh, fissure opening uh, or fluid loss. Um, I have some, uh, some references for you at the end of this presentation to read about this technique if you're interested. So um, let me now talk about some examples of um, analysis using um, uh, our technique, which is wavelet transform and comparison with MRP um, uh, as, as a, I would say, analytical technique. So here again, you have another job. This is from Marcellus Shale, a stage uh, is one stage of that job. You, you see the rate here and pressure, recorded pressure, and you see the propane concentration entering the fraction fluid. Um, if we do, um, if we analyze that data for rate and pressure separately using the energy density plot that I explained and um, put them on top of each other here, um, you, what, what we see is an interesting trend. Um, you see at some of the decomposition levels, they have a same trend. In some of them, uh, there is a deviation, basically in the energy of the noise that, that we have for pressure and rate. So we call wherever these two are on top of each other or have the same trend, we call that rate related, related events because we think that in that specific frequencies, um, there is no um, uh, fracture, there is no fracture activity basically. Uh, and the other um, frequencies that we, we see some def the deviation in rate and pressure uh, we call it rock and rate related events because we still have the rate, rate uh, effect, but the rock related events, which are a fracture, interaction with natural fracture and so on are entering. Um, and then as I told you with uh, the pseudo frequency concept, we can basically can calculate what are the frequency of those events uh, if you're interested. So the plot that you see here is a comparison between one of these um, uh, pressure and rate signals uh, in the, the uh, energy distribution plot of the noise. And you see they follow one another and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but if we pick one of these that we, one of these uh, decomposition levels that we see there is a maximum deviation um, and we plot it in, in, in time, you see that uh, those behave, behave differently. For example, this point, we don't see any change in pressure in rate, which is in red, but there is some changes in pressure. Uh, so that is some interesting uh, thing to investigate further. Um, now, if we, what we did, we we basically, as I, as I told you, we based our um, um, kind of benchmark method, MRP as, as our benchmark method, and we compared what we observed with this technique with MRP. And um, we, are, we, we noticed that there are two groups of points. There is uh, groups of point that there are some changes in pressure only, and there is no change in rate. As I told you, point 12 is uh, an example of that. Uh, point nine probably is, is an example of that. Point five is probably another example. Um, seven is another example. Uh, and there are some points that there are some changes in, in, in rate, but the changes in pressure are uh, different uh, um, or much bigger than rate. And those are the points that are highlighted here, for example, or here. 
and comparing with the with MRP, what we were, what we saw that is that, um, for example, those points who the points in group one are pointing to um, some uh, specific uh, 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 events in MRP and pointing group two are pointing to to um, another. So I think this um, the point one, the point, the point, the group one are pointing to the normal propagation region and point group two are pointing to um, fracture, fracture height uh, growth. Uh, we, this is uh, still uh, an ongoing investigation and we are um, working on more data and uh, looking at it in uh, more like uh, in more details to um, figure out what's going on there. Um, another example is the stage two of that job. Same, uh, same way you see pressure rate and propane concentration. And if you plot the energy uh, density of each decomposition level, what we see is again, um, at some point we have same trend for pressure and rate. And before that, there is some deviation in the energy of the noise. Um, again, rock related events, rock and rate related events, you can calculate the frequency of each. And then if you plot them for comparison, you see um, that um, in this region, they follow one another. In the other region, you saw some, you see some points um, that are that are causing the difference. Again, if we compare this with energy density with uh, MRP, we see that uh, again we have two point two groups of points, um, and in this case, we identified points two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and fourteen as normal fracture propagation from here because that's what is shown in. Um, MRP, uh, it's verified using MRP. And uh, 1, 3, 5, 7, 8, 11, 13, and 15 are attributed to the fracture height growth. As I said, we're still working on this and um, hopefully you can read the future publications of the group for more details on, on the developments. Um, so here is a comparison between the two examples that I showed you. And one interesting thing is that um, if uh, uh, for both cases, we we have the deviation the between pressure and rate energy um, somehow in in uh, levels three to seven, I would say. And after eight, there is nothing. Before three, also they, there is nothing, uh, which tells us that um, the the fracture interaction with natural fracture. Uh, is also a function, the frequency of the, uh, that, that interaction is, is uh, probably uh, the, a function of the fluid that we're using and um, also um, the rock type. So now uh, that was basically it uh, for fracture propagation um, analysis. Uh, the next part of the talk is basically the second part of the talk is wavelet for analysis of bottom hole pressure in DFI. In this case, unlike the previous case, we don't have rate, we only have pressure. Um, and what we think is as the fracture closes, some noise is induced because the boundary of fracture is moving and we have fluid inside a fracture. Um, and after the closure moment, the energy level of the noise should not change because there's no other change in the system. Basically, the fracture has closed and uh, the, the fraction fluid is, uh, has leaked, uh, leaked off into the formation. Um, before going to the analysis in this section, Let me talk about what is fracture injection test or what people know as DFEAT or Diagnostics Fracture Injection Test. Uh, this test is done for getting um, properties, some properties about the reservoir. And the way it's done is that a small volume of fluid, um, fluid is injected to break the rock. So you see here we have the rate and pressure. We start injecting and the pressure will continue going up at point two, which is the maximum observed pressure, uh, the rock will break. And after we see this breakdown pressure, we continue injecting fluid into this, um, into the wellbore. 
And typically, we, we, until we see the uh, uh, pressure that has zero a slope, which is an indication of this part here, indication of a fracture uh, propagation. So we keep injecting uh, to make sure that we create a small fracture in the rock. Um, after we saw this point, the zero slope, we um, basically stopped the pump. Uh, and at, at that point, the, the pressure is recorded. The pressure response of the wellbore is recorded and is used for um, further analysis. So what you see, um, uh, basically the region five and six are, is what is being analyzed. So the analysis after this point is um, uh, basically is, is uh, 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 categorized to two different uh, sections. Uh, one is called the before closure and after closure, because we have an open fracture at this point, and uh, which uh, that, and the pore pressure inside the fracture is is greater than the, the, the reservoir pore pressure because the fracture is open. Um, and after we stop the pumps, the fracture will leak off into the formation, and the face of the fracture starts to close. And at some point, um, the face of the fracture will be closed. You know, the the fracture will be closed. And that is called uh, the fracture closure pressure, which is an indication of the far field minimum horizontal stress. Um, so based on that, based on where that closure pressure is, this analysis can be categorized to before and after closure analysis. Um, but the problem is that uh, identifying that fracture closure moment, which is, uh, as I said, is close to minimum horizontal stress, assuming that the fracture is identical, is orthogonal to um, minimum horizontal stress, um, is not that straightforward um, uh, and it's hard to get because of several reasons. And um, we think that signal processing may, may add a value and I will show you how it, it will add value in, in the analysis of um, uh, defeat. Um, one of the most mostly used and probably well-known, most well-known method for analyzing defeat is called G-function. Uh, G-function, basically in this technique, you calculate a couple of parameters. One is the G parameter, then you um, get the GDPDG and DPDG, um, and you plot them versus G. And also, of course, the pressure that we have from fall off. So you see here, this is the set, this is region five and five and six together. So um, the way this analysis is done, the red, the red plot here is GDP DG. And if we, um, based on this technique, before the fracture closure point, uh, this GDP DG should, uh, should be in form of um, almost a straight line. So if we, if we draw a line from zero of this uh, plot, uh, origin of this plot basically, um, to GDPDG, we see that this is going to, to uh, be on top of that, uh, the, the GDPDG. And um, whenever this uh, red line uh, starts to deviate from that tangent line, we pick it as closure pressure. That's the way um, this technique works. But as you can see, um, it's not that straightforward in some of the cases to say exactly where that closure could be because you, um, in some of the cases, um, we can see multiple tangent lines, we can plot multiple tangent lines to the data, and that makes it difficult. Um, to analyze the data. For example, this case is for one case which was given to us by an oil, oil company. Uh, we picked closure at 4.4 hours. And uh, in their analysis, uh, they picked the closure at uh, closely five hours. So there is some difference between what we think the, uh, the closure pressure and minimum horizontal stress is and what they think. So depending on who is analyzing the data, uh, one may come up with different closure pressure and 
based on this, the whole calculation regarding the fracturing job, uh, pad, the propan, and things like that will change. So this is a very important parameter to obtain from, uh, from the reservoir. Um, what we observed using signal processing and what we're proposing basically and working on is if we plot the energy density of the decomposition levels, we see that they have different trends. So we call this trends low frequency, high frequency region, and medium range. And we plot the energy distribution with time for these three different regions. What we observed was interesting. We saw that there are levels of energy of the noise in the data. So what, I'm, what I mean is, here we said we have a level of energy which is shown by one, then we have a transition zone and a second level of energy, region four, is in a lower energy level and this uh, verifies the hypothesis that we have. Uh, um, we think you need to think about it this way. Um, if, the, if this is the fracture closure, then after that, no increase is observed in the noise in the data, in that specific frequency. And note that um, the y-axis here is in log scale, so you have orders of magnitude reduction in the noise in the data. So the point that we have, the start of fracture closure with this technique, if that, if that happens here, let's say, it's close to five hours, what was picked by um, the given results and analysis. And the, the full fracture closure at this point is at 5.7 hours. Um, to investigate this, uh, let me show you more examples. So here I have um, four more examples for oil and gas uh, cases, and one example for um, a geothermal case. So I go through them um, quickly. Um, in this case, we had 16.8 barrel per minute treated water injected to a formation for 15 minutes, then pressure fall off was recorded uh, for 20 minutes with a sampling rate of one second. Uh, you see a G function analysis on the right, and this is a perfect example of G function probably. Uh, there is no um, uh, ambiguity about it. Uh, the the G function, the, the closure pressure of the fracture using G function is at 5,822 psi, and at time of 27.8 uh, minutes. So if we do, if we analyze the same example using our proposed technique, um, uh, and this is and this is the composition level num uh, number three, what we observe that the energy of the noise in the signal. Um, reduces initially what you see in region A and at some point uh, it, it stays constant and it stays constant toward the end of the job. Um, so what, what, uh, what we observed that um, and, and what we thought that if this is the closure the energy of the, the noise should, should be minimum and stay constant and that's the case here and we pick the closure at the intersection of these two lines. So, and if we compare that, uh, we have we, the closure pressure using this technique is 5,790 PSI, which happens at 27.95 minutes. Comparing to G function, this happens slightly after what is picked by G function. So another example, another straightforward case, uh, average of 0.28 barrel per, barrel per minute of water was injected into formation for 12 minutes. Uh, then pressure fall off was recorded after shutting for uh, close to 777 minutes with a sampling rate of one second. Um, the closure pressure in this case using G function was 26,756 psi um, at uh, 822 seconds. So analyzing this data using our proposed methodology, um, you see again there is a reduction in the noise in the data. And then after that, uh, we see that the noise in the data stays constant. And if we pick the closure there, then our technique shows that the closure pressure is 28,756 PSI at uh, 761 seconds. 
uh, the, if you compare these two, we have a huge difference here. This is 2000 PSI difference in, um, in the closure pressure. And also our technique uh, shows that fracture um, closes earlier than what is, what is being taught by G function. So filter case number three here, um, fracture fluid was injected into the formation for 12 minutes and uh, we the, the pressure was recorded for 165 minutes after that with sampling rate of one second. Um, you see an indication of water hammer um, here and here, um, which is an indication of tight formation. And there is a slight increase in the GDPDG curve after the closure, which attributes to fracture growth after pumping. In this case, we picked the closure at 2,656 PSI um, at 13.6 minutes. And again, using our technique here, um, you see clearly that there is a reduction region for the noise in the data, and the noise stay con stays constant after that. Um, and if we pick the closure here, uh, we see that uh, the closure is going to be 2,702 PSI, which is at 13.5. Um, this, and as I said in the previous case, similar to case two, example two, uh, we see that fracture closes before what is picked by, picked by um, uh, G function technique, which is not an uh, uncommon thing. Uh, there are other techniques in the industry that suggest that the uh, uh, fracture closure happens uh, earlier than G function, but uh, we have we, we, we think that fracture closure happens uh, closer to G function than the other techniques. Um, and the advantage of our technique is, as I, as I said, it's restrict, it's, it's not restricted to any assumption. We don't have any assumption about the pressure um or any uh, among, i mean about the fracture geometry about reservoir properties we actually we don't know any of that and we just rely on the pressure data that is recorded from the reservoir and this is a great advantage of um, our technique so here is an interesting case um, as i told you g function is not as a straightforward always so here water is injected in with average rate of 2.8 barrel per minute for three minutes into the formation and these are the formation properties and because this test was long we had to cut the data beyond 32 hours um, so here we have three possible candidates for putting the tangent line, as you see. And this is one disadvantage of uh, G function. Um, one can put the tangent line here, here, or here. Um, and then you, you will have different closure pressures depending on where you put your, uh, your tangent line. Um, this was a given analysis and they picked the closure pressure as 13,521 PSI. So if we analyze it using what we are proposing with wavelet, uh, we can confirm it one more time. Here, again, what we see is energy reduces a couple of orders of magnitude, and it stays constant at some minimum level of noise energy. And if we pick the closure pressure now at this intersection, we have, we have the closure at 13,521 PSI, at 45 minutes, uh, which is very close to what is picked by the analysis that they have done. But here again, we don't have any extra information, it's just pressure data, and uh, you're not going to miss the closure using this technique, comparing to the other technique, the G-function technique. Um, This is another, um, actually this is one other interesting thing about the example that I showed you. If you plot the whole thing, the whole noise of the data, distribution of the energy in the noise, um, for the whole job, um, we see some uh, interesting um, um, observations. Here toward the end, you see the temperature effect. We have a jump in the noise in the data, which can be attributed to the temperature effect and the earlier part of this job, um, if we zoom in into that, you saw the analysis for that part here in this plot. 
basically is is what is uh, what is used for measuring like uh, identify the closure pressure. So to summarize what what I showed you, um, I showed you four different cases. You see G function analysis um, for for closure uh, the the closure time and pressure using G function analysis and using energy density plot or wavelet transform. Um, one observation is that the closure can happen before, after, or at the same time with G function. We do not control that, and the method uh, will, will identify that. And we don't control uh, wh when the fracture closure should happen. Um, another example of this technique is geothermal reservoirs. In geothermal reservoirs, what we do um, is basically we inject cold water into the hot reservoir and we want to extract heat, extract, we basically heat up the water using the temperature in these reservoirs and we extract um, hot water um, that can be used for multiple um, purposes. Here, um, this example is Utah Forge in Utah, United States. Um, it's a geothermal reservoir. Um, you see that they have done multiple tests in this, uh, in this reservoir. Um, the closure pressure using another technique, which is pumping flow back, was in range of 4,300 um, to 4,700 PSI. And we analyzed, I'm going to show you first the hole. As a whole, a whole, all of the all of the tests that they have done on this reservoir using our technology, and also um, I will show you analysis of this part only. So here you see this is the whole noise in the data in level three, the composition level three in the data, and as you can see, there is reduction in noise level, energy, and then a minimum reduction, minimum, and a reduction minimum. So in each of these, you can pick one. Um, closure basically. Um, so if we pick the um, the first one that I told you and apply our technique um, again, reduction in noise level and then uh, a constant minimum, and we pick the closure at 4,120 psi uh, for this reservoir. Um, just to briefly, that was it for defeat. Uh, to briefly go over other applications of this. Uh, uh, wavelet transform, um, we have applied it to um, other uh, areas um, for both bottom hole pressure and rate for inter interval connectivity. Uh, the interval connectivity is used in EOR or water flooding to see, let's say we have uh, multiple injector and producers in a field and we want to see uh, where, where the fluid that we're injecting goes. How is the connection between, let's say, ex, uh, one injector with another producers? Um, the interval relationship is nonlinear first and um, non-stationary. It changes with time. Uh, production uh, data also represent a non-stationary signal. The methodology um, is that we use a multi-resolution analysis, the feed, ana uh, I mean, wavelet analysis, as I talked to you about earlier. Um, on injection and production rates, and uh, we also um, I, uh, apply a cross-correlation uh, uh, coefficient on that. And we, we give them a correlation coefficient between each injection and production. Um, so these are popular techniques that are used for um, uh, finding correlation between uh, data, uh, Pearson, you see the formulation for each of them, and you may read it in your um, own time. Um, I'm just naming them here, Pearson technique, candles, uh, tau coefficient, and experiment row. Uh, these are um, uh, methods for finding correlation between data. Um, in, in our technique, we, we apply wavelet transform uh, for uh, pressure and inje injection, and for producer and inject injector, and you see the time, and we if we put them on top of each other, you see that there are correlation, and there is a gap because uh, when you see a change in the in the in the injector, um, it, it takes some time for that change to reach to the producer, and you see there are some correlation between these two um, producer and injector. Another concept is cross correlation technique. With cross correlation technique, we're able to um, basically give a number. Um, uh, the advantage of this that 
uh, other than giving a number for correlation between two signals, it can also account for the lag. So here you see um, two examples, basically. These are just uh, artificial um, curves created by us. Um, and as you see, we, we are able to get the lag and peak, and you see how strong this cross correlation is compared to other techniques. Again, for more compli complicated case, we have two sources and one receiver. And what you see is, again, uh, it accounts for the lag and also um, for, for basically for uh, source number, source one to receiver in blue and source two to receiver in red. So we have also some synthetic cases to show how this will behave, how this technique, the proposed uh, wavelet analysis will behave in, in um, water flooding project. This table shows uh, basically a comparison between a case that we created in CMD software, one injector, two producers, um, and the distance between these two was longer than this. And you see, we saw that more, uh, it shows a more uh, a stronger correlation between injector one and a producer two, and you see the comparison between the Spearman technique. Uh, we went to more complicated cases also, uh, which I skip it here, but in more complicated cases, the performance of our proposed uh, technique was um, um, better than the other techniques. Here we um, compared our technique with uh, CRM technique uh, and, and a benchmark exa example of CRM technique. Um, for a reservoir with uh, five injectors and four producers, uh, everything, the properties of the reservoir was the same, uh, five millidarcy reservoir, but they had purposely put a channel of thousand millidarcy and 500 millidarcy here. And in this table, we have summarized how our tech, how CRM um, see, sees basically the relationship between injector and producers, how our technique uh, uh, basically uh, evaluate that and how other techniques are uh, uh, calculate the relationship. There is a good match between these two, uh, proposed technology and CRM, but other techniques will not do um, as good as our techniques. Uh, so we analyze this field example um, using this technique and you see um, um, how uh, this table, for example, this I1P1 means um, injector one, producer one. Um, the, the location of this producer and injectors is not as shown in this figure because of confidentiality in the data we had to plot it this way. But we were able to get um, basically the correlation between a, a complex system like this using uh, what, I, what I talked about. Another example, again, you see the correlation between um, uh, different injector producers. And that was um, basically it. So um, to conclude my talk, the proposed approach, uh, which is a signal processing technique using wavelet transform, uh, for any of the application that I talked about, uh, fracturing, um, uh, defeat, or um, interval connectivity, is pure signal, is based on pure signal, and um, basically we rely on recorded pressure during fall off, rate and pressure during injection, and rate and pressure for interval connectivity. Um, our approach has a great advantage that unlike other techniques, analytical or numerical, um, the, the we don't have any assumption about fracture dimension, leak off, rock permeability, and other things, and we just depend on the signal that we record from the field. Um, in terms of fracture closure, we showed that fracture can possibly be closed before, after, or at the same time with G function. Um, the effect of temperature can be, can be captured using our technique, and I showed you an example of that. Uh, during fracturing events like a screen out, propant uh, entering the, the, the fluid can be identified. Um, connection between injector and producer can be identified in inter uh, well connectivity and water flooding project as I, as I explained. Uh, the closure events, which is, uh, which is a, a very important property of, of the reservoir, uh, can be identified uh, directly 
uh, and uh, from this distinctive energy trends as, as I explained in uh, using multiple examples. And also, um, as, I, as I told you, um, the comparison between our technique and other techniques confirms that um, how our technique is first easy to use, second, it's, um, it can identify um, what is important to us much more easy, easily than, than the other um, techniques. So um, for the reference, uh, for your further information or reading, if you're interested in any of this topic, you can uh, refer to Piraish et al. for uh, moving reference point technique that I talked about and uh, uh, Soleiman et al. for analysis of different cases uh, using moving reference point. And you also can refer to Onel et al. Um, um, in these four publications. Uh, for different applications of Wavelet, for fracturing data, for defeat, or for Intel well connectivity. And with that, I would like to end my talk. Um, I uh, thank you for uh, uh, attending this presentation. I hope uh, I was able to add to your knowledge about um, analyzing um, data, and I would like to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. We all would like to thank you for the amazing webinar you presented today. We have received many questions, but I have collected the most important ones. Uh, the first question is, what DWT means? Okay, discrete wavelet transform. As I said, uh, wavelet transform can be uh, continuous or discontinuous or discrete. And DWT means discrete wavelet transform. Thank you so much. Uh, the second question, uh, someone is asking, what is the process of normalization to come up with energy density plot? Okay, let me go back to... Okay, in order to normalize it, basically you need to have a base for basically, um, we want to present it as a percentage, basically normalization. Um, so we calculate the, uh, the total energy of the signal. Let's say we have the pressure in this case, we have pressure here. So we calculate the total energy, the, the energy of this, the area below this curve using this technique, basically. Since it's not a continuous function, we do it this way. Um, and then for each of these decomposition levels, which is which are shown by D, we do the same thing. We calculate uh, the area below the curve and we divide it. Basically, the normalization is this part. We divide it by that number we, that we calculated from the original signal. That's what I mean by normalization. I hope um, I answered the question. Thank you so much, you did. Uh, one of the questions I received, uh, what is the difference between rock and rate-related event? And rate-related event, what do we need to pick this, to pick and separate the levels into these uh, two events regimes? Okay, the, the question is, what is the difference between rock and rate-related events and rate-related mm -hmm. events? Related event, yes. And what was the second part of the question? Why do we need to pick and separate the levels into, into two regimes or into two event regimes? Okay, so during hydraulic fracturing, you know, what we want to interpret from a hydraulic fracturing job is basically the dimensions of the fracture. We want to see where the fracture is going um, what's the dimension, what's the height, what's the width, and what's the length of the fracture. Uh, we want to also know that if our fracture has intersected a natural fracture because um, uh, that uh, causes, that will, that will change our calculation when we want, uh, that will change the, the calculation that we have later in reservoir studies. Um, the reason that we deviate this, basically, we separate to rate-related events and rock-related events is that because uh, we want to get, um, 
We want to know whether our fracture is propagating in height or not, for example. And here, as I said, we pick the rate as the source and pressure as, as the response. And since they are following one another, we are sure that not in this frequency, at least these frequencies, um, there is no interaction, for example, between hydraulic fracture and natural fractures. We don't see it in this frequency. But here, um, for let's say we talk about, we pick one of them. Let's say we, think about, we pick uh, number six, the composition level number six, and we talk about this. So for the rate, we have this much energy. For the pressure, we have this much energy. And the deviation tells us that the noise, because the, the difference between the energy, uh, basically, yes. The difference between the energies of these two, these two, the, these the rate and pressure tells us that there is some noise entering into our data. That's why we, we separate them uh, to, two, to two regions. And since in this region, there is no separation between them, first we say there is nothing coming from the rock. And here we can say there is, other than what we see in pressure, there are some uh, changes coming from the rock, which can be anything. We don't know yet. We need to go to energy distribution plus to identify those. Thank you so much. Uh, and the last question is, what is uh, DFIT stand for? DFIT stands for Diagnostics Fracture Injection Test. So this test that I explained here has different names. Uh, if you want to call it in general, we can call it fracture injection test uh, because we inject and we want to get some information. But diagnostic fracture injection test or DFIT is the most well-known name for this, uh, basically the test that we're doing here. DFIT means um, the test that we're using here. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. Thank you so much for the great webinar. We really appreciate uh, the informative webinar. And thank you guys for watching. We hope to see you uh, in the next webinar for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. You have a great day.